All right. Well, thank you all for coming today. This is the R to R breakout, the rolling deck to repository breakout. We're the group that collects uh, your underway cruise data distribution from you. And we uh, break it out. We describe it a little bit. We submit it uh, to National Data Center for Archive. You'll hear a little bit more about that. Uh, from Drew later on. <clears throat> Just wanted to take a moment to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, so R to R is a four institution collaboration. Uh, it's led currently from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia uh, with participation from Woods Hole, Florida State University and Scripps where I'm at. Uh, I'd like to invite the R to R people in the audience to stand up <clears throat> and say hello. <laughs> Thank you. We're also identifying that is uh, we really like to use Ivy Tech as an opportunity to talk to a representative from each vessel, make sure that our uh, vessel sort of device inventory and uh, directory information we have from you is correct. Uh, so please come and find one of us if you'd like to check your vessel. We also have office hours. We'll be having um, right after today's presentation <clears throat> down in the hotel lobby in front of Starbucks. We'll be chatting with folks. If you have any questions or if you wanna check your vessel, please come find us. We also have another one, same place at 3.15 tomorrow. <clears throat> so just a quick note. Um, some of you may have heard uh, that Suzanne Carbot, who is the current PI from Columbia, who's leading R to R, she will be stepping off the project, uh, but we will be continuing, continuing as our uh, collaboration. It'll be led from uh, scripts going forward, uh, but uh, most of the same team will keep going with that. All right, so with that, I will hand it over to Raphael. I'm Karen Stocks. I might not have said that at the beginning. <laughs> Hi. I should have sat closer because then it just looks like, I don't know, it looks like, like I don't know, like a runway or something, whatever. Um, hi, uh, I'm Raphael uh, and we're just, Raphael Uribe, um, it's good to see you all. I'm gonna go touching on some, we're gonna briefly touch on just some basic stuff about directory structures and data transfer methods. Um, and then we're gonna hopefully leave some space open for a discussion and also leave a space open for a discussion later, if that is easier. Um, so basically, we have some best practices for directory structure and obviously like every, to preserve the original full resolution data from the instruments, um, especially primary nav, uh, organized files in a standard directory structure that can be easily broken out uh, shore side with the regex, um, matching against a vessel profile, which is why sometimes we are constantly uh, emailing you guys to try to set up meetings so we can uh, update those. One serve. Um, and also segregating uh, routine underway data um, from documentation, products, and process data. So it's really important to keep all of those apart so that we are served. Science party information from distros. Uh, it's something that we've noticed where we occasionally find like folders and directories full of just from like photos of like the scientists or something like that. And that's something we definitely want to avoid going forward. Um, but that, that's, that's a lot of words. Uh, so this is sort of a general overview of what the directory structure might look like. Uh, I'll allow you all to take a maybe a more detailed view of the documentation on our website. That's what the QR code is for. So you're welcome to scan that um, and kind of get a sense for what we suggest is a great, great breakdown of your data. And again, setting up your break that out easier and also gives us a better sense of 
if there's something weird with your data set, there's like some data that might be missing that isn't supposed to be, um, it's easier for us to kind of notice that before getting too far in, too far into the process and we can reach out and kind of figure that out. Yeah, and we just want to emphasize that it's really important that the directory structure, we can use a regex to find the data. Um, we want to make sure that pretty much every every new cruiser isn't like big changes going on in the directory structure. That's super important. Uh, and there are several different ways that data is transferred. And here are just a few examples. Um, so we have Globus, uh, some network transfer like SFTP, RSync, cloud downloads, physical drives. And obviously they all have their benefit, their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and we obviously, of course, try to do our best to accommodate every operator and whatever their their needs are and your current situation. Uh, but I do, I do think that something that we do want to try to do is kind of move away from the physical drives um, and some cloud downloads, which has some pretty glaring uh, limitations. So, for example, physical drive, just like general, you know, you could lose a drive. Uh, it can get lost in the mail, just even something. It's not downloading properly. Um, so it is, we're trying to, um, so yeah, like I said, there are a lot of metrics that we like to use. So like cost, security, distress size, transfers getting interrupted. Um, can the data be pushed? And does your IT need to configure it on your end? And does your IT need to configure it? And does, does our IT need to configure that process? So two methods that have that we've liked to sort of move towards um, is using Globus, um, SFTP, and RSync, of course, because they're just a couple things, but of course, but of course we can definitely like discuss what kind of transfer method works best for you. Um, so I know for all of you out there who are clamoring for moving towards rsync, Eric, <laughs> we could talk about that later. <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely like setting up a dialogue because these, these are kind of just like the first steps for the process. And I think even making these steps more efficient, a more efficient transfer of data and the data itself being, uh, the data is structured in a really like nice clean way that we can break out properly is really important for reducing bottlenecks and getting the data, getting the, having the raw underway data go through its process and get uh, eventually public as fast and efficiently as possible. Um, but of course, I would be happy to discuss specifics. And also, again, I'll reemphasize that we appear to serve and just like whatever transfer method works best for you, we are here to try to accommodate that in any way. Um, and I'm hoping that starts a discussion, but we can have the discussion now, we can have the discussion later, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever you want. Um, yeah, so that's actually that's actually it. Um, so I'm hoping it's a little more conversation than staring at slides, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, please, if anyone has any questions, please. Well, um, Data <laughs> well, well, it I guess it depends. Uh, data transfer, like the directory structures, would be fine. Um, but all the, if you have like gen more general questions about like R to R, uh, or more specific questions related to just the data that, uh, in your case, that you'd be sending us, we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, of course. Um, or you can ask the question, and I can tell you if I can answer the question. <laughs> I was uh, mentally revisiting the question that Jasmine had about uh, Coriolis uh, doesn't so much process the data as they have time span and pretend. So in a way, the original data are still there. So I don't remember who it was who so just suggested that that R to R would really love to have it come out that initial candidate that just sort of mm -hmm. 
Okay, so yeah. So, 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 just go to that. Okay. Can you repeat the question for me so I can repeat the question? <laughs> should just have the raw data itself or the data plus the time stamps and I wasn't sure what the resolution of that was. Okay, so basically the question was to sort of revisit the previous question about Coriolis and whether the data should uh, include like the timestamp and like either include or in not include the timestamp as a, yeah. <laughs> um, and just kind of having, kind of going back on that, uh, yeah. Did you get that? I think I did. So, so if it's the ball, yeah. oh. you know, the pre branded time stamps, that's okay. That's considered raw data still. So. Yeah, so as long as it's like the full resolution data with the time stamp, that's a time stamp that's considered the raw data. So Drew and Drew made we sort of touched on that. Yeah, of course. I think I saw a hand raised in the back, but I'm not sure. Yeah, were you, Suzanne? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, we are <laughs> Got it. Yeah. So, I can I can rephrase I can reiterate that so the so the challenge with our sync is that basically you can't push data to us because of just Lamont's like IT specifications uh we need to essentially be able to pull from pull from the operator so that requires some configuration on the operator's end so that we have access and we're able to pull um, as opposed to Globus, which we do have a place where you could push data to us. Um, that doesn't require subscription, but it does also require IT configuration on both ends. So it's a little nitty gritty. So it's definitely like, that's definitely something that's gonna require one-on-one -on -one conversation to get that set up. Any other questions? Yeah, I think, think that's good. Feel free to catch me. I, I get lost in the lobby a lot. So if you find me, just like ask me a question, it's fine. That is. Yeah. You will, right? Check in the community. Uh, yeah, uh, I if I can find it, I would love to check it. Oh, you can check in the link. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, I'll check it. No worries. <laughs> uh, this one is, I believe, that's you. That looks like good. That's you. And thank you. Um, all right. Yeah. So uh, my name is Drew Clark. I've been working with the R to R program from the beginning. So we've done 15 years now of data um, collection from all the operators and the vessels. It's been it's been pretty amazing. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out is that. There's no conference I would feel comfortable presenting in shorts in a Hawaiian shirt. So thank you, Toby. <laughs> he definitely set us up. Um, I'm gonna make sure I've got this. Okay, good. So I'm just gonna talk about data formats. Um, we call this towards known data formats. That's a very selfish name because all you guys know the data formats already, the operators, the techs, um, you guys already know the formats, but they're just not always getting relayed to R to R. 
So I just wanted to make that kind of uh, the point of this first slide. There will be a background, a discussion about the full R to R um, project in the plenary uh, on Thursday. So we're just doing pieces of it right now. These are just the components. And so, but I did want to just, if anybody doesn't know that much about R to R, I just wanted to go ahead and point out that this is our workflow. And it's a little bit, you know, more than just all good. Okay, a little technical issue maybe. Okay, good. So within this box, um, we've got this, you know, one side, that's all the, the um, shipboard data that's coming to us. So everything that's sent from the operators, um, we get the raw distro at the end of the cruise. And this is where it comes, gets transferred to R2R &R, like uh, Raphael was just mentioning. And, we, you know, do some uh, work on that um, and we organize it. But then we also have a feedback pipe where we can feedback information that we know. Because it's post-cruise, we can't give real-time feedback, um, at least not at this moment. So, you know, there's limits to what we can feedback. But once it gets, you know, moved into R to R, then we do some uh, organization. And then we... Uh, Put together a set of metadata, uh, cruise level and device level. Um, then we make this available to uh, the science community. So this is, uh, you know, something you can download data from our website once it's been released. Um, and then we want to move as much of this data as we can into a long-term archive. So this is to the, the NCEI to the NOAA archives. And the requirement for that is that it's well documented. So that's where. Um, We've run into some issues with trying to push some of the data. And I think this morning we had a really good um, keynote um, discussion about data that gets into these syntheses projects. And, you know, that's where a lot of this data is going to go. So if it's well documented, it's going to make it into those, those syntheses. Otherwise, you know, we can't submit this to a national archive. So that's kind of the, the driving force behind this, this talk. And I, I also want to make one last point. Because data has been flowing to us so well, um, we're going to actually, you know, I only have a couple of slides, so we're going to be good to even try to get you out here a little early. So enjoy that. All right, so let's just um, just give a basic, you know, summary of uh, what the descriptions are for format, for file formats. So the concept here is that it's necessary for a scientist to have all of the descriptions about the file um, so that they can reuse these data in the future. Um, and this is also true for us to submit it to NCI or to the national data centers for them to archive it. Um, and basically the format description is really just, you know, desc describes the structure of that file. Uh, so it's given the name, the units of each column. So now you know how to reuse it. Um, the whole idea is that the end user can then use this file in the future. And we always kind of consider, let's say you had to write a data parser for a file that was collected 10 years ago. Do you have enough information to be able to do that? So that's kind of the bar that we're, we're kind of looking at. And at R, &R the current status is that not all of the formats are described um, to the level of which we can, you know, reuse these later, write a parser or submit them. Um, also, you know, we've collected a fair amount of, of format information, but these formats do change over time. And we don't typically have a good way to keep these up to date at this time. You know, at one point we collected the file information, we just kind of keep using that same uh, information. So we're trying, we're looking at methods where we can do this more in a real, in the real time basis, um, figure that we're post cruise. So if you get a file, you know, six months after it was collected, it's hard to then maintain that file format information. Um, you want to capture it and keep it with that file at the time of collection. 
So um, just a couple of concepts of, you know, the formats themselves, some of them are really well described. So we're not talking about everything off the ship. You know, there's things like the multi-beam data is a flavor of uh, net CDF, um, very well described format. It's self uh, describing, there's tons of tools to be able to work on this. So this is considered, you know, a well described format that we don't need extra information for. Also looking at these, uh, of, you know, these new systems that are um, coming online, the Coriolex, once we start seeing, you know, uh, files from the uh, RCRVs, you know, these systems have the opportunity to um, put or to include this, the uh, format information in the files themselves. SCS has that kind of format, open BDM. And there's other, there's certain formats that are well-known. So SegWi files, it's a very well-defined format. It's not that they always adhere to that, but they, they are well-defined. And then there's proprietary formats like CTD data. Um, and then there's, you know, a set of other ones that are not as well-described in our world. So those are the ones we're kind of talking about right now. So some of our approaches, um, you know, the, the approaches that are out there right now that are self-describing formats. So, um, you know, the RDesk um, group doing, putting together Coriolex, it's, it's a, you know, it's an amazing system. Uh, we've been working with them, with them to try to, you know, make sure that the data that we get, the raw data sets that do come to R2R, um, that they have enough metadata in them or alongside with, it, <clears throat> with them, not necessarily in the file, but, you know, we're working with them trying to have a header, maybe a, a defined header. Um, and then, you know, enough information to describe those formats. So, you know, Coriolis has this, this great, idea, you know, concept of being able to put a, a line in as the header to describe each format, uh, each uh, column in the format. And that's good because it's included with a file. It may not be something that is computer readable or parsable. Then there's uh, SCS with the XML file, the XML configuration file, which does have, you know, a fair amount of information. They tend to have every parameter um, listed out that goes into a single file. So if we maintain that file, then we have, you know, enough information to put it together after the fact. But that is machine readable, um, but it's not uh, part of the file itself. And then I just wanted to put out one more example. This is a, an old uh, format, the SIO met uh, format. It was a PDF file. So not, you know, computer readable, um, but what it had was it had all of the column information, plus it had all the um, formulas to calculate all of the values. So it just had, a, it was a fully inclusive uh, type of um, we'll call a supplemental file to go with, it, with the data. And so what the reason I'm pointing these three out is there's aspects of all three of these that would really solve the problem. If we could get all of these, you know, the key parts into a single uh, header file or a supplemental file, we're at a good point for being able to, to describe these data. Um, and I'm kind of at the, this is the last slide without questions, uh, a question slide. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, you know, ask the room, you know, do, are, are there other tools, methods out there that people are using um, that we don't know about, you know, and, you know, we're trying to work close with as many of these groups as possible so that we can get this information and have it um, available to R2R. Um, so I just put in, you know, kind of the seed questions. Do you know um, how your vessel stores format information? Do they store it? And then um, how do you use um, the format documentation? Or what or what do you use for the documentation that is? Um, so, you know, a couple of questions. And one, one thing I just wanted to throw out there is we're looking at um, an extension of a five-year for the RDR program. And we're considering look, uh, opening up more files than we do. Typically, we don't really open files and look at them, but we're considering doing a, a more of a surface QA of a number of files. And with that, we would like to start to collect code 
from people who parse files and put it into a GitHub repository and just have some way to maintain this over time. Um, I'm going to leave it up. I hope you guys have some questions. If not, enjoy the beach. But um, that's all I have for the moment. Any good questions? Where's my seated questions? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Tensor workshop is that uh, R2R is not currently looking at PK80 data. Is that true? Is that a true statement? We'd like to not look at it. It's huge. A large data set in that, in that R2R. So, system. so the question was is R2R looking at um, moving EK80 data into our archive and then passing it off to a national repository, and we are. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any caveats for that, but we have, you know, we've had a number of cruises that have it. Um, like I say, they're humongous for the most part. Um, there might be some subsampled uh, versions of it coming in the future. I'm not sure how that'll go, um, but yes, we are. Uh, oh, sorry, Sean. Brandy. I got one online question uh, from Tess Chapman. We are on our workflow page. Could you please talk a little bit more about the shopping documentation and how vocabularies such as NERC fit into your pipeline? Um, do I need to repeat that question? So. Vocabularies. Um, that might be one for Rebecca. I see her sitting in the back. Do you want to try to feel that? Yeah. She's done such a good job of harmonizing our metadata, and this is our device metadata. Okay. <laughs> one more time for me. Okay. Slow page. Could you please talk a little bit more about the The QA. Yeah. Um, but the controlled vocabularies, we've gone through all the instruments that are to our hosts and we've mapped them to a NERC L2. And those I think are P3 um, NERC vocabulary. So um, in this instance, you can go on to the R2R website and there is a web address. I don't remember which one it is. I think I'd have to talk to Suzanne. Um, but you can click on it and it redirects you to the L22 um, NERC vocabulary. And it gives you a good description of what it is, what kind of parameters, and like who uh, manufactured the device. I hope that answers that question. And then on the QA documentation, we do have links on our web uh, website to um, all the steps that are taken in the QA. Um, so that's, and it's per device type. And then the actual um, download of the metadata about that, it's an XML file that has all the different parameters that we check for, the ratings that that file had uh, achieved, and then some other information along the lines of, you know, when it was run. Does that answer to the question? Let's assume yes. Okay, uh, any more questions online or anybody else? Like I said, yeah. Oh, Sean, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just actually have a follow up to the question I think you're about to be um, As Drew mentioned, we're working on our next five year uh, proposal. And so, getting any input but from the community about how much the demand for this system is growing, uh, you know, it's a question of how operational the system is, is it starting to be remodeled? Yeah. Getting back to like the, the MFP for the planning and so we'll see how many, how many cruises we you know, because it's a real big resource issue. So we have to figure out, you know, how much disk space is enough that we have access to. So, so it is if any input we get a group of official firm also. 
So that, that, that happened though, do you, do you collect and store it again? You just don't look at it or do you just like- We'll look at it. Yeah, we do store it. And the um, NCEI has said that they would like to consider taking it, especially the SegWi version of it. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I don't think they've collected anything yet. Any, any kind of unsupported instrument that, that we sent to our or does that get at least stored in an archive somewhere or do you, do you just delete some of it that isn't really? So the question was any unsupported um, device type or would that be like science party? It's an NSH funded instrument. And so our data set is going to have a data buyer folder or something. Okay. What happens with that? When we it? And, and so if R to R will archive these um, data sets that we might not know about or they're exper experimental, the um, the answer to that is if it's on the, on the cruise distro, those as is get stored um, for long term storage. And so they're accessible. And now on the web page, you can now search by um, name across the entire distro. They may not be download links for all of the device types that are in there, you know, the ones we know there's downloads for. But because of the search page, now you could find those files and download them. If this becomes a standard underway device, then we're going to eventually break them out and make them official. Uh, device types. If it's just a science party, you know, those typically don't, uh, a science party device, they typically don't make it on the distro. Does that answer your question? Okay, great, thanks. Jules. I have had a heck of a time trying to find any data that we ever submitted to NCEI. <laughs> the search function are terrible. And you're asking me? <laughs> Because, because you have a direct feedback with them from the sessions. So you have somewhere in there, there is a way to go from, I found this thing on r because this is the NCEI page that has it. Is there any, any from, I want to be able to programmatically use R, find what's stuff in NCEI. So I either need to learn what they do, so yeah and i think you you would want to get around kind of the web page search and have like an api search um or at least whatever however that works i want to get something back that i can use programmatically and i think through the api you, you could do that okay. and we've just bumped up um, so on our webpage, we've added a new sidebar, that, which has some of the things that people weren't finding, uh, which is really nice because now they have, you know, the APIs are um, now a little easier to find. And um, they're well described, so you can see what you can access uh, from the APIs. Right, but what I'm looking for is the target. You want that link. That's target if there is one. Right, right. Um, if you wanted just a quick you know, summary, we could work out, you know, getting a database dump for you that would give you, you know, all that information, we could set that up, but then we'd work it into an API over time. Okay. Right. Yeah, and I know, uh, so we had, had a we had a request for some ADCP data and they went to, um, to NOAA or to NCEI. And basically what they had done is they put every file as a web link. And this person thought they had to click through every file in the ADCP and download them individually. And how many are there? There's maybe a couple hundred, right? Oh. Files per, yeah. Yeah, Vicki, yeah. A quick follow up for that. I'm pretty sure I query to get links for multi-data. So I'm pretty sure you can get them I have a suggestion actually for the next couple of weeks. I don't know why, but it's for here. Um, in the context of the global multi resolution conference, this is the future of our conference. 
um, it would be the So, Vicki, let me let me repeat that question. Just you were asking how before, let's say, multi-beam data gets um, moved into NCEI and available on their map page, would there be a way that R to R could show the coverage that um, of data sets that hadn't been submitted yet? Right. And I, I think our answer on that, I think we would agree that initially our goal was to get things pushed into to NCI so fast that they would have that page available. And it's not always a reality. Um, so we could, we might want to revisit that as a useful tool in R to R. Um, but I think that's a team discussion. Um, but it's a good suggestion, Neil. So thank you for that. That's interesting. The National Exploration Forum last year and in years back, one third of the experiences. Because there's a lot of examples of data exist that it takes so long for the data to get into the archive. It showed up on the map that basically ever. One, one thing I'd like to add that is that not all of our data sets are um, publicly available yet because of the data release. So I just wanted to throw that in there too. But then. That's a great point. So it doesn't just sit blank for two years. Yeah. <laughs> if that only finds that, yeah, anyway, I think about the good thing. All the UH DAS data that we submitted through end to end because they bypassed you, but we can't find any of the stuff that all the various groups that we need. Yeah. So the, the discussion is about um, data that you can't find at NCEI. Um, their interface isn't always great or it's not always available. All right, any more questions? Are you guys ready to head on out or? Yeah, Karen Stocks. And then the lobby. Today at four, maybe earlier. Um, and then tomorrow at is tomorrow three fifteen? So we'll do a three fifteen in the lobby too next to uh, Starbucks. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>